blues historian, one of the co-founders of Living Blues. Some of you might have seen a book hanging around over there by Ulrich Egel called Blues Music in the 60s. This particular book helped channel the focus for this Living Blues panel. Janice and I, and considering David Whitus's views on the same subject, thought that race, gender, and living blues was a good place to start. Race goes everywhere the blues goes these days. In fact, I think on the last panel when they were talking about uh, furious juvenile scribblers, I wondered how many white people in the room were thinking, thank God I'm an exception. <laughs> was it all of us, or was it only 99% of us? <laughs> Well, Gustav, uh, excuse me, Ulrich Abel claims to be writing an objective, racially objective study of what was going on with race in the blues in the 60s. He talks about his objectivity, but he says one of the great female blues pioneers was Janis Joplin. Surprise! <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> How ubiquitous is race? Do you know Sue Foley, the white female guitar player who's been around quite a while? Just this morning, I got a note from Amazon saying, as someone who has purchased a book on Robert Johnson, you will probably be interested in this new book by Sue Foley. <laughs> Actually, I'm not, but that's why we're having this panel. Let me say a few words about gender also. People who know my work know that I often write from a psychoanalytic and a surrealist perspective. Both fields have an unusual gender orientation. Surrealists have already been accused of too often putting women on a pedestal, but it was also a field open to many women artists and poets. Likewise, uh, psychoanalysis was similar. Freud had a big problem with women. But psychoanalysis was a field wide open to women, and there were many analysts like Karen Horney and Helene Deutsch and Frieda Fromm Reitman. Blues, to a far greater extent than surrealism or psychoanalysis, has been an equal opportunity employer for women. I'm not suggesting that women in blues weren't subject to sexism and gender bias, but I am saying the blues has welcomed women with open arms. They have even pioneered a new field, blues philanthropy. However, the same equal opportunity standard does not apply when it comes to blues journalism, making Amy Van Single a rare bird indeed. Thus, Amy was a pioneer in the field of blues journalism and blues radio, precisely at the time that she thought she was getting the short end of the stick. But I think that's what pioneering is about. It gets lonely out there. And that's why we're proud and privileged to have Amy on this panel. Jim O'Neill literally needs no introduction to all of you, I'm sure. Scott Beretta was the editor of Living Blues after the magazine moved to Oxford, Mississippi. And he's had a lot of first-hand exposure to race and gender issues at the magazine. Mark Hemrick, like Scott, came all the way from Mississippi to join us today, and we're very grateful. Mark is the current publications manager for Living Blues, and we're very privileged to have someone who can speak on Living Blues in the present tense instead of in the past tense. We may or we may not have time for questions at the end. We're going to wind up at five of five. But let's get started now with Amy. Uh, hello, is this on? Yes. OK, um, I'm Amy, AKA Atomic Mama. And um, I do feel I, I was and I perhaps still am in a peculiar place. I am the wrong race and the wrong gender for having done what I did. Uh, I did what I did, which included starting up Living Blues because uh, of what I heard on the radio in the 1960s. Uh, the British invasion swept through America. All these Brits were playing American blues. I was very naive about radio back then. I would write to radio stations, literally, uh, little, little funny notes about, um, hey, I heard uh, Eric Clapton do uh, uh, go out the back door, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, why are you playing Eric Clapton when you can find the original by, say, Jimmy Reed? I know it can be found out there because I found it. I did not know at that time that 
radio was all about money. Uh, so I objected to that. That made no sense to me. So when the opportunity uh, both to do radio and to start up Living Blues came along, I did both. I started playing what I considered authentic blues uh, at Northwestern University uh, and uh, was on the, the editorial board of Living Blues magazine from the get-go. Um, another interesting aspect of my early uh, blues orientation was that I worked for Bob Kester both at the Jazz Record Mart and at Delmark Records, and I'm the only fool in the world that worked for him twice. <laughs> I love him dearly. Paul also worked for Bob Kester, and we could go on about that for a while, but uh, I learned about the blues uh, through these other people, in addition to you know, why, what I heard in my head. It, it was very, very strongly imprinted on me, I think, because I was in adolescence. It was the middle of the civil rights movement, and I have a very strong sense of justice. And uh, I always, I'm, I'm the kind of personality that wants to step up for the deserving poor, or the underdog. Um, what I did for Living Blues was basically the physical operation for, for many, many years. I was the typesetter, I was the photographer, I was the pay stuff person, I did the subscriptions, I ran the hand-operated subscription addressing machine, um, I developed negatives, I printed prints, I designed advertising, etc. Uh, I did this in my spare time because uh, Living Blues did not make money either. Uh, so somebody had to pay the bills and I took the day jobs. Um, it was grueling work. It was uh, nonstop. I, I typeset in the morning, I'd go to my day job, which may or may not have been during the day. I worked a swing shift for a while. I'd come back, typeset some more, get up the next morning and do it again. Weekends were similar. Uh, we'd go out at night uh, for all hours to listen to live blues, and I wrote when I could. When the magazine transferred uh, to Ole Miss, I inadvertently gave my job away. I did not know this at the time. Uh, Jim and I needed a break because it had become unbearably stressful. Uh, I thought I could get my job back in a few months. That never happened. So I took a, a rather large personal toll doing Living Blues, but I'm proud now of what I did. But it took many years to get over um, being shamed by, by my own family for doing Living Blues. It was not a suitable occupation. Uh, but the music would not go away, so I went back to doing radio and I started writing again. Um, I'm up in Alaska. Alaska is not a big uh, blues state. They like the country and bluegrass. There's plenty of lip service blues, but I, I am continuing in my crusade. Uh, what that means to, to race and gender, I can't tell you. You'll have to decide for yourself. He wanted to say she ran the address of graph. <laughs> well, it loaded some chore. Okay, Jim has a multimedia presentation for us, so let's switch to Jim. First of all, uh, thanks to Amy for all that work, and if you want to see some of those hand address magazines, some of them should have her handwriting written to the subscribers, and some are with that stamped mimeograph machine for the address. We've got them for sale over at the, uh, the atrium. <laughs> We started, when we started Living Blues, uh, as, as Amy said, a, a lot of our interest was, at least for Amy and me, it was inspired by the, um, the rock bands who were covering blues, and we discovered where it had come from and wondered why had it been, why had it been hidden from us. And it felt like there was some conspiracy, you know, you could read about blues, maybe a paragraph in Rolling Stone or an article here or there in, Grand, in uh, Downbeat or Sing Out. But there had never, you know, blues was at that point, 50 years past its first recording, there had never been a blues magazine in America. 
So we may have not have been the most qualified people to start the Blues Magazine or to write about it, but we loved it and thought other people needed to know about it. So uh, that's how the new Blues got started. And in the first issue, Bruce Dickbauer, who was one of the founding editors, wrote the editorial, I believe, that stated that we did not intend to define the Blues. And of course, by the very nature of what we covered in the magazine, we did define what our take on the Blues was. And uh, we focused on African American blues, um, and it, it became more than just the roots of rock and roll. You know, that that quickly that's still the hook to get people into it. You know, Eric Clapton did this song, or the Rolling Stones did this song, and it came from this blues artist. But it, the actual story, the culture, the history, the, the biographies. The, of the blues artists and their lives and their stories. That was what really got us, you know, it's what was the most intriguing part and it still is to me. I can listen, I can interview blues artists today and I don't get tired of hearing the story about them moving from Mississippi to Chicago and all that. So it's, uh, it's an ongoing uh, passion that we have. And our constituency, when we, had, when we started the magazine, my idea, that the, the primary constituency, and it was a very, pretty small one, was the black blues artists themselves. And I made sure that uh, on our compliment subscription list, B.B. King, Willie Dixon, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, they were all in it. They all got the magazine as long as we were publishing it. And, and people in the blues business, too. We gave away a lot of magazines just so people would know what we were doing. And we felt that the in, in view of the extensive coverage you can read about the Rolling Stones and different white blues acts, white blues rock acts, uh, Janis Joplin had just been on the cover of Newsweek or Time heralding the rebirth of the blues. Um, we felt that not only did the artists deserve, the, the black artists deserve due consideration, but maybe extra consideration from us to make up for what wasn't being covered elsewhere. And uh, so we maintained that focus through the years and just trying to dig deeper into the history and hopefully present it uh, as well as we can and try to tell in the artist's own words uh, more often than not. And of course we got some reactions to that. Um, a lot of readers said uh, we, we agree with your policy in general, but uh, there's, some, there's one exception. In our town there's this band and you put all those bands together, you've got you know 200 bands, 200 white bands that were supposed to be covered because they're exceptions. And so we decided just the, the best thing to do is just to keep it focused, you know, on the on the black musicians. And and uh, but we so we'd get hate mail once in a while. Or, and the most publicity we ever got was the uh, not about what we were doing to cover black musicians, but what we were doing that excluded white musicians. There was an article in the Chicago Tribune. That's the focus of the book, that, of the chapter in the book that Paul was just talking about, and, and a couple of others like that. So it, it is an issue, the issue of can white musicians play the blues? That, that wasn't something that was prevalent in living blues. I mean, we didn't ask that in interviews very often. I did, I think, when I first got started, just to see what people thought, but then, it wasn't asked very often, and it, you know, it only came up once in a while. And but whenever it did, it created some kind of firestorm. Um, I think we lost our first subscribers when we did, did the Surrealist issue. That Paul was a member of the Surrealist group, and uh, they had an attack on white musicians that, that lost a few, a few subscribers. Um, But um, like I said, we didn't focus on that issue a lot. And sometimes, you know, I, I thought that the main thing that we should do is just to continue to stop, tell the stories of the African American musicians and let them tell their stories. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes I think we should have done more to stir things up. Uh, but I didn't want to do it, you know, I wasn't, I didn't want to spend my time having to debate that issue every day, and it is a daily issue, I think about it every day, because there's people still 
call about it one way or the other. And even though I'm not involved in producing the magazine anymore, you know, I get a call from the blues artist's wife who's just uh, irate about it and reactions among black musicians are, are very different. You know, some are very, uh, very happy to share the stage with white musicians to, uh, you know, that say anybody can play the music. And others, you know, I've seen others be enraged, in tears about it. So, um, so, but we didn't bring the issue up very often, and I, I think maybe it needs to be brought up more often. And because I think generations have gone by, but the issue is not even brought up. I don't think there are a lot of people who, who are aware that it even is an issue. I, uh, when I was living in Mississippi, I met a white guitar player from New York who had come down and he was just stunned because he'd been playing the blues, he thought, for years and a black school teacher had asked him, uh, well, don't you know that's our music? And he just said, it never heard anything like that. You know, it's like it's everybody's music, you know. So, uh, yeah. It's worth mentioning because one of my articles on white blues is posted on the web in the bluesworld.com site. I do get about two hate letters a year, pretty regularly, calling me a racist pig. You know, but because I had been brought up as a surrealist, I learned to love the hate. <laughs> but still, it can be disconcerting. And though um, a lot of African American artists uh, feel that something needs to be said, it's it's a politically and economically dangerous issue to bring up. So I've talked to a number of musicians who say, uh, you know, if we say anything about it, we'll get blackballed. Blackballed in more than one way, I guess. Uh, right, right. And uh, I know uh, one of our contributors tried to put together uh, a blues is black music CD several years ago, and he approached several artists, and that was the response he got. Even the ones he knew believed that blues was black music, but, but the response was that no, it's too dangerous. You know, we'll lose jobs if we do that. Now I'd like to play um, a little videotape. Um, it's a complex issue because, in one sense, um, African American musicians want to bring in white participation to encourage it to be inclusive, you know, for white people to appreciate it and to feel it. And on the other hand, there is a sense of cultural property. So this is a clip from um, a documentary called Blue Story. It was filmed in 1998, but only aired in 2003, the year of the blues, but pretty much got overlooked because of the Scorsese series. But this is Rufus Thomas. This, is, this clip is what was actually in the documentary, this first one right here. Just because you are a white man and you come home from your, your, your office, your white shirt, and, you know, the white collar and suit and everything, and you come home from work, take your key, but first you park your car, because you got yourself a big, nice car. You park your car in your two car garage. First thing you see, and knock the other car. Take your key, open your door. When that door is open, you look into your house and there is nothing, no furniture. And you go to the kitchen and you see nothing. Your woman is gone and the children are gone. She's even taken the linoleum up off the floor. She's even taken the salt out of the shaker. And just because you white, you think you ain't got the blue? Well, you got it, and you got them back. So that's why I say today that blues belongs to the world. I said the world to the universe because Okay, that's what was actually in the documentary. Now, um, like I said, I didn't usually bring this issue up with artists, but I had the sense that Rufus had some other feelings about the issue. 
So uh, a little bit later, I asked him, what did the blues have to do with being black? So uh, we'll get to that uh, in just a minute here. And, and I'll say this, this part, the producers chose not to put in a documentary.
started working in uh, graduate school in sociology, and my uh, topic was uh, was blues. Uh, and um, I uh, entered journalism by virtue of wanting to publish some of the research I did. I think my first article was on Bob Kester of uh, 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 Delmark Records and Jazz Record Mart here. And uh, this was for Jefferson Magazine, uh, named after Brian Lemon Jefferson. It was, uh, I think, the oldest uh, uh, running blues magazine, several years older than Living Blues, formed in Stockholm in 1968. Um, I became, I was asked to start reviewing records and writing other things, and then uh, they had an emergency meeting for the magazine, and I suddenly ended up the editor of uh, this uh, Scandinavian language magazine. Um, <laughs> and uh, with, I, I, just, I am fluent in Swedish, but uh, I'm not a great writer in Swedish. But anyways, I sort of accidentally happened into this strange position of <laughs> being the editor of a uh, Swedish blues magazine, and uh, in doing that, I think, you know, my job was really like sort of assembling it. They just gave me a computer. I'd never done layout, and they said, here's the files, here's you know, these little programs, and do it. So when, when I came into it, there weren't really a lot of ideological issues to deal with. It was like, oh my God, how do you put a picture caption next to a photograph? And, and it was really an issue of really assembling the magazine, and so I wasn't aware of a lot of these racial representation issues, and also, being in Sweden, it's not the most African-American place in the world. I guess you can say, we do we have some African-American musician, but it wasn't a, you know, it was a very white country, I guess. But uh, one of the interesting things uh, uh, about uh, uh, Sweden, when running into the Swedes, was finding all these Swedes who had uh, gone on multi-month trips to the United States. I've never really encountered people like that in the United States. Some of our living blues researchers will you know, go on trips out to Oakland or down to Mississippi, but uh, I'm sure some of the Swedes might have visited your all's house, but, uh, or a lot of Europeans would come, and some are probably here today, travel around the states for several months, you know, staying in the south side and the west side and in Oakland and in Jackson, Mississippi, and so that helped introduce me towards some of the broader contact of someone who'd come from uh, listening to records or going out to clubs in Washington, D.C., uh, eventually, I came to, uh, I, I moved back to the United States in 99 to become the editor of Living Blues. And I was aware of Living Blues having done all these incredible uh, uh, long uh, articles on, you know, artists that uh, addressed a lot of sort of the sociological issues. Uh, one of the interesting things about Living Blues versus the British or European magazines, they tend to Living Blues tends to be a lot less discographical. The Europeans tend to write about records a lot more, and I think at Living Blues, at least the emergent form was that of asking artists really detailed questions about their life, about their views on their art, um, uh, not you know aggressively pursuing these issues that uh, we just took up with Rufus Thomas, but certainly not uh, censoring them. Uh, if we, you know, running. Articles that run 15,000, 20,000 words, uh, you know, which no magazines do that anymore, I don't think. So we, we, we certainly provided a lot of room for people to express these things. Of course, some artists probably didn't want to talk to some, you know, white person asking them about it. Others certainly did. Robert Lockwood, uh, I just did a cover story on uh, Corey Harris, who, uh, who you know, Corey Harris, who was addressed these issues very directly. But in any case, I, I came to the magazine with knowledge of how good the articles were in terms of historical research, but um, was unaware of all these issues. And when I came to take over the mantle at Living Blues, I was like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to put these, guy, these, you know, these white guys on the cover? I was like, I don't know. I have to do this first issue. So I guess basically it kind of, kind of came to me as kind of a surprise. You know, as a sociologist, I was very aware of you know, rep issues of representation. <laughs> of race and gender and all these things, but it, it was a hot seat I really wasn't quite prepared for. Um, I guess my feelings on it is a, a lot of it is that our audience generally is interested in a lot of the uh, older recordings, which are, you know, the vast majority of which are uh, done by African-American artists. There simply weren't a whole lot of white artists back in the, you know, aside from Jimmy Rogers and Harmonica Frank, um, and a very small number of white artists who could be considered blues artists, I think, up through the 70s, but um, uh, I guess for my take, it was, you know, less, I was aware of the ideological debate, but I didn't really, I was more interested in 
these are the sorts of artists who I'm interested in, and, and also in Living Blues being the magazine of African American uh, blues, I was very interested in putting together issues that concentrated on broader context. My first issue was uh, about Kansas City. I inherited this issue that had been bouncing around for a couple of years, uh, uh, and which talked about sort of the historical development of Kansas City Blues. I've been able to work on issues on the North Mississippi scene, uh, the Chicago scene a couple of years ago, uh, a big issue in Mississippi, an upcoming one in Natchez. By virtue of focusing on a region or on a scene, and that brings up a lot of, you know, what were the social conditions like, what were the uh, shared experiences. So, I mean, that's been my interest, I guess, as a sociologist. You know, that's why I, I like the approach of Living Blues and, and focusing on, on, on social context instead of just like with another magazine that's out now. On, this, is, this guy has got a new record out, and it's really great, which is, you know, <laughs> which is not something we do, and it pisses off the artists. <laughs> Okay, Mark is going to speak now, and Mark at least will be speaking from the present tense, of something that doesn't always happen with living blues retrospectives. Mark? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I came to uh, Living Blues as a PhD student at the University of Mississippi, and I've been working there now for uh, over six years. Um, <clears throat> first off, one of the things I'd like to, to acknowledge is that um, with the magazine, you know, I joined, I was, I guess, 35 years old when I joined, but um, along with that came a lot of goodwill that I inherited, and people refer to me, my, my first name is Living, my last name is Blues, when I call them, hey, it's Living Blues on the phone. And, um, and Jim and Amy is, is such a constant reference, so um, I, I'm very fortunate to have inherited that. Um, but as far as the, the with respect to the, the editorial policy and the, and the black-white issue um, that I think we see with putting out today's magazine, um, I, I uh, maybe when I first joined, you, we get a few nasty emails, hey, you know, you guys are racist, that kind of thing. Re I really haven't seen that very much at all. And uh, if anything, I, I, I think that what brings that issue to light is the difference between the blues audiences, the, the black blues audience, which, and I'm generalizing, of course, but um, in general, uh, the black blues audience is, is more attuned to, say, a soul blues artist. Um, and, and the white listeners are really not interested in that. And that's just my feedback from being at the magazine and the response we'll get to articles if we cover a Marvin Cease um, versus covering uh, you know, a Robert Cray um, or somebody who's, who's more attuned to, say, a white audience. Um, and in fact, it, it really came to light um, about a year ago. Um, uh, we have the Living Blues Awards, um, which is where right now I think we're in our 16th year with those. And uh, I approached a promoter um, over in the Delta and I said, hey, we'd really like to put together a, an award show. Um, you know, maybe just one, one evening, we give out a couple of awards and we'll have a couple of guys play. Um, and he told me very pointedly that, um, you know, that'd be great, but we can only have down-home artists. Um, and he said, we, you know, I, I don't want any of that soul stuff. Um, and I said, well, you know, we, we've got a nice balance. You know, we're gonna have guys that are gonna win that are down-home and we're gonna have guys that play soul blues that are definitely gonna win. Um, and he said, well, I just, you know, that's not going to bring the audience that we need. So um, it's a very, uh, for a magazine that struggles like we do, um, it, it, it really becomes kind of a commercial element. There's a commercial element to it all. And it's, it's how do we best serve our audience? How do we best serve the legacy? Um, which um, is, is both good and bad. Um, there, there's, a, there's a tremendous legacy, like I spoke, of, of all this goodwill that's been engendered and, and musicians respond to my, they return my phone calls and they want to speak. And, and they'll very often speak very freely and, and uh, through no doing of my own. Um, but um, it, it's also, uh, that there's that specter of, of you know, covering only black artists. Um, and I, I've come to realize that it's really not uh, that much of a challenge in terms of are there enough black blues artists out there to continue to cover. I mean, obviously, we've lost all the greats, the Little Miltons. Um, and, and you know, R.O. Burnside and a few others. Um, and it will, we will continue to do that, obviously, as that generation, you know, the, over the next decade continues to, to, to pass. Um, but I think the challenge then becomes is, is uh, I, I have yet to speak to a black musician who can't in some way inform me about blues and their influence, that its influence on their music. Um, Vernon Reed, a guitar player um, for Living Color, uh, I spoke to him. He, he produced the uh, recent James Blood Ulmer albums. 
um, James Blood Omer himself, um, I spent a day with him, um, a lot of people would have considered him a, a jazz artist. Um, he, he was able to speak about blues in a way that it was just so fundamentally deep and, and emotional um, that uh, I, I think that the, the, the opportunities are there to, um, to really just continue um, um, that discussion, that dialogue with black blues artists. Um, we, we recently did a Birmingham, uh, Alabama issue, and, and really the thought was, um, we weren't, you know, the, the Birmingham has never really had, a, it's never really been recognized for having a, a, a deep, deep tradition. Um, certainly the, the geeks and the scholars will know about it, but the popular culture, I think, doesn't really consider Birmingham um, in, in, a, in a blues discussion. And we, we knew, we said, if you've got, if you've got a black population that, that, that's that large, Certainly, there's got to be a blues scene and a blues culture that's there. And of course, we went there, we found it, and and we'll do the same thing in Atlanta, Cincinnati, um, and, and the magazine has done that. I'm not saying this is this is brand new. The, the magazine did, did, did the Kentucky issue, and, um, and and they've continued to do that. But um, uh, again, I, the the issue of, of race, it's I think it's pretty well accepted at this point that that's what the magazine does, and people either buy it or they don't. Um, and uh, it just becomes a challenge for us as readers, or as writers, um, to just continue to seek it out and, and see where we can find it. Great. Thank you. <laughs> for once, we're actually running ahead of schedule. And maybe we can use some of this time to catch up. But quickly, if there are any questions. Um, so, excuse me, Jim. Yeah, we, we haven't addressed the gender issue very much, and uh, even though we had a female editor for a long time, uh, we didn't have a lot of female coverage yeah. in the magazine. But I think, in one sense, that was a reflection of, of the performances, the recordings, and the performance that we saw out there. Um, there's a kind of a resurgence of female performance in the 80s, but uh, I think during the 70s there weren't. A whole lot of the thing that I remember, you know, when we got to the blues clubs in Chicago, there might be a female guest vocalist once in a while, and other than other than Coco Taylor, Bonnie Lee, and a few artists like that, there were, there weren't many artists. I, I think one of the things that I mean, one of, if you look historically at who was recording, you've had a number of periods when you've had more, a lot more, a uh, higher percentage of uh, females. That'd be like 1920 to 1925, 26. You know. Uh, and then I think in the in the late 40s and early 50s with the uh, jump blues bands, uh, a lot of the big <clears throat> R&B bands with the female vocalists in front of them. And then later in the uh, 60s with soul music, you see a lot of women. I think one of the things that's happened more recently in the blues scene is, uh, I guess in very practical terms, you go to a blues festival nowadays, um, we did larger municipal blues festivals. You see a lot of artists who were formerly defined as soul musicians. Uh, Solomon Burke, when you look at someone, Betty, Betty Levette, uh, Irma Thomas. Um, there's another one that you might be using. Uh, but that's one of the directions in which we've moved as soul music has become increasingly, you know, I want to get into it, decide what is, blue, is soul music blues. For practi practical purposes, it is if you measure it by who is being issued on soul, uh, on blues labels, who is appearing at things called uh, blues festivals. And I think the magazine has moved more into documenting. Uh, yep, David? Race, I think, in this case, race and gender come together. Um, the readership of Living Blues, I think, is safe to say, is not only white. All right? Yeah. I think it's safe to say. And, if someone's going to say, hey, I want to write for your magazine, it's probably someone who's read your magazine. So 80% of the time, it's probably going to be someone who's like. <coughs> On the African-American blues circuit, and this has been true for many, many years, the blues audience is a strongly female audience. Go to a soul blues show right now. I don't care if it's a male like Bobby Rush or a female like Lisa Sal. It's real light up. And it's been that way. I wasn't around in the 50s, but people like Leonard Jess who Mark and Martin in the 50s say blues has always been a women's audience. Or largely women's audience in the African American community, at least for a long time. If you weren't getting a lot of women writers, perhaps it was because, you're not fault of your own, I guess, 
you were appealing for the white readership. Because many of the women blues fans are African American women, historically and currently, at least in the soul blues scene. Does that make sense to you? And this is what I've seen. Does it make sense to you or anyone else here? I'd like to make another comment on gender. Um, here is another room. It, it may be a stero stereotype, but I don't think so. I think uh, black women in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, I don't know how long, uh, were of course preoccupied with their families and raising children. Uh, if they did go out to work, it would often be as a domestic. Uh, they were not overtly respected or equal with males. Uh, women blues singers who proceeded in those careers, like Memphis Minnie, must have been incredibly strong personalities to endure the hardships they must have felt. Uh, as a female blues observer, um, I was stereotyped as people would assume that I loved all female blues singers. Uh, this was not the case. There weren't that many of them. And frankly, my ears are not tuned to the female vocal range very well. Again, for what that's worth. Anything else? Yep. Yep. I just wanted to get back to, uh, uh, Mark is the only one who's even mentioned the word commercial in here. Uh, because Living Blues wasn't set up to be a commercial enterprise. and. Uh, it's become more commercial because now it has to pay some salaries, and to do that they have to sell ads. And if you look in the magazine now, a lot of the ads are for uh, white bands. And the review section, there, there are a lot of white ads reviewed in the review section as well. But I just wanted to go back. I realized I didn't finish the comment I made about the constituency of the magazine. I always thought the, uh, in fact, the blues singers themselves are the most important people to reach. But the, the uh, main uh, number of blues fans who read the magazine were um, white males. At that time, they were younger and middle-aged. Now, they're still left. They're pretty old. <laughs> but like Chuck D said, old is good. Um, but there was about, about a third of the magazine readership was overseas. A quarter to a third was in Europe, Japan, and Australia. And the, uh, the last constituency we appealed to was advertisers. We didn't really care whether uh, we had ads in the magazine very much, and we certainly weren't going to adjust the editorial content, content because of it. And I realized, you know, having, uh, having acquired a degree in journalism, I knew better than that, that that wasn't the way you're supposed to run a magazine. But we thought that what we were writing about was more important than selling ads.
<laughs> I've been living in California, but they delight in call I live in Southern California. They delight in calling that the Southland. I do not find that cute. But uh, in many ways, it is. There's a lot of, even though um, Brother Chuck D made some extraordinary uh, uh, points today, amazing points, I did want to say that um, around Southern California, there's a lot of Louisiana, a lot of Texas, black folks from those directions. And so I discovered a lot about the rules in clubs in Riverside, California. And, 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 and folks up there, it was like, you could have been, been in a temple. It was like, ooh, it's deep up in here. You know, I learned about that community. Um, and women are doing the do. But the, 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 the idea of who is who and what's really what, stasis does not serve the development of culture. And so it's really, you know, it's interesting to look at what the community is looking at. Who are they going to see? And, and, and women are up in it. They are, uh, they're writing, they're performing, they're producing. They are actually active in Southern California and also in Chicago. Thank you. That's a good point on, on that notion about uh, um, black females being involved in rap. Um, that's one of the things I know we've been discussing over the past few weeks is um, there has, there was, uh, obviously the, the advent of rap, if you take it back to say 1979 in New York City or a little later into Los Angeles, um, none of, you know, none of that got much play in Living Blues. And um, would a black writer have sensed that? Would a young writer in New York or LA? And that's one of the problems uh, that is like the magazine is that we do what we can with what we have. And we didn't have, we don't have writers. We can't send writers here and there. Um, but um, it's just one of the things that, that I've always wondered about how that how that genre, which is so pervasive, um, now you're starting to see you know the books come out, the the, the theoretical approaches to it all. But um, it's just it's just a little strange that it just didn't get much play at all in, in the blues magazine. Uh, I think also the, the issues that you just discussed, which of course uh, like Angela Davis and Hazel Carver have written about, the, the, the assertiveness of the early blues women, Prova, right? Yeah, the, the feminism. Uh, you do find a lot of that actually in the uh, contemporary uh, soul blues or chitlin circuit scene. Uh, that that is, you know, by artists like uh, Miss Jody uh, or older artists like uh, Denise LaSalle, Sheba Potts, right? So there is a continuation of it. Though that scene is very much. Uh, not doesn't really have a national scope or it's sort of under the radar but you know, we have sort of moved into that and i guess just, just want to say that, that that does exist in the blues world in that area as well as as well as with uh, many of the artists in, in chicago or mississippi yeah i think as uh, dave has attested to uh black women are more loyal to Blues, because they are people who are not in total denial. Uh, they like for the truth to be told. And as <clears throat> strange as it might seem, they enjoy it. Because a lot of female singers and rappers are saying things to men. They wish they had the courage to say that. And like Denise LaSalle, I'm, I'm a promoter, so I know. You know, 90% and they comes to most our concerts. I got repeats at 85% of my concerts. And I get to know them personally. And they say, well, I don't want nobody talking about a be this or be that. You know, I want. Denise to say what I really want to say. But for the sake of my kids, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> you know, you understand? So that's where the black woman becomes a loyal supporter because she can identify with the stories that are being told on the stage. 
I think historically it was uh, uh, African American women who were the biggest buyers of the records too. So there's been, I mean, part of what our magazine is reflecting is women that became more white male guitar oriented. So that's, you know, from a pure marketing perspective, that's what we have to address. You know, whether it be introducing rap music or uh, when we've gone into Zydeco or Southern Soul, we've had you know, some people just, I've certainly run into people who are subscribers to the magazine, but that ain't blue. So we, we have had some marketing issues with it. Well, the definition for blues has changed tremendously. Uh, blues is a matter of perception, or comprehension is a better word. What part of it applies to you? That's what makes it the blues. You know, we can, it's not blue until it makes you say it. You know what I'm saying? So when the truth hits home, then it's the blues. Now we're not talking about commercial blues. We talking about blues that the general public identifies with. You know, I've had artists like a Bobby Rush that the crowd would not go away because he did so many things that they understood. You know, so it's the connection between the fan and the artist that makes it blues. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, oh, sorry. You know, the only thing about that is that if I think about something like, uh, two, two issues. One is lack of the black women black women blues. Uh, black women performers might be a little less likely to be associated with an instrument than the male ones. Uh, and, but secondly, it looks to me like if you think about something like those foundations or listings, you get a very interesting mixture of since of women uh, that, are, that are involved there that, that, could be, that could be considered. So my, I think my recommendation is that you can think a little harder about that and if necessary, and if necessary to think a little bit more about Investigating a little of the history that's involved, and a little of the way these women have been maybe, maybe shifted a bit around something called blues uh, as they go on with their careers. Uh, I'm not too comfortable with the same thing that I'm not there. Okay. I think we're wrapping things up here. Janice, do you have any last announcements you want to make? Well, I actually would love my provost. Lincoln University, Cheryl Johnson Oden, to ask a question. Uh, well, it's, okay. it's half comment and half question. Thank you. Uh, this is not my area of expertise, but all the same, I'm thinking back to some of the things that Chuck D was talking about this morning when he was sort of interweaving his discussion of blues and, and rap. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that he said that this gentleman here was also echoing was the, the whole notion of both of these genres sort of being almost divided in, in a way that said, this is, the, this is the classic tradition, this is the beginning of the authentic tradition, and then there's this other tradition layered on top of it that's more commercialized, it becomes. And the reason I'm raising that is because I'm thinking that also one of the things that was raised this morning was the notion of the porosity and how porous uh, the blues and jazz are. And for that matter, uh, some people argue that there is a lot of uh, porosity between the blues and uh, gospel music. So that, you know, when you talk about black women and their participation in the blues tradition, uh, you know, I don't know, I mean, when sometimes when I listen to some of the things that say that Betty Carter said, or some of the things that Nina Simone even said, you know, even though they both became, you know, uh, commercial artists, there was certainly an element in there that is clearly the blues tradition. And even when you think about uh, an early Aretha Franklin, you know, before she sort of, you know, crosses another border, there is this, this influence of blues. And so the, the porosity between, you know, gospel music, between, you know, the blues tradition, whether it's a classic blues tradition or a more commercialized blues tradition, or, or, you know, jazz singers, you know, not to mention, of course, the people that, uh, that some of you alluded to, like, uh, you know, Billie Holiday, or, you know, or others. Uh, so, you know, I, I just, want to urge us, and I also want to know what you think about what I said, but I also want to urge us not to be too insular 
in our in our discussion about you know the role that women have played in blues and how the blues have influenced these other women. Oh, oh I, well, I just like, I think we did say it was it was an uh, ideological. Uh, view that we had, but within the blues world, I think that there has been an expansion of how blues is interpreted. I think when the magazine was founded, there was much more of a concentration on the sort of the country blues or sort of the Chicago style urban blues, but I, I think that, you know, over the years there has been a, an expansion of who we're interpreting as, as blues singers, like I said, going into soul and uh, soul blues, uh, to a certain degree jazz that was, I think, largely ex excluded from the uh, magazine in the earlier years. Would that be the case? Yeah, we, we very rarely cover jazz, which is an area of blues that could be covered. You know, it's, it's, uh, we just never did uh, delve into that too much. But when the blues started, if you looked in the blues discographies and the other blues magazines and blues books that were being written, uh, artists like Bobby Bland, Little Milton, Little Lester Phillips, uh, Lattimore, Ted Taylor, none of those were considered blues artists. I mean, not even Noel Milton and Bobby Bland. They're not listed in the blues discography. So we did try to break that line, and that was partly uh, an appeal to to black readership, but also uh, just because we thought that was part of the blues theme that should be covered. I think uh, Chicago Bo, you have a question? Yeah, I just, um, I was thinking a bit about race and gender, and you know, I've been looking at Living Blues magazine for a number of years, on and off, and we used to trade ads back at, <laughs> at some point, and that was very good, because I certainly like a lot of the direction that Living Blues is going in, but as the five of you sit there, uh, founders and editors of the magazine, I still think there's something painfully missing from the Living Blues picture. I mean, we've been around white folks for 400 years. <laughs> but none of us can get a degree that states, here's a degree in being around white folks for 400 years. <laughs> Even if we started fighting ourselves. But white folks can go and be around black folks and go and immerse yourselves in, you know, in various uh, ghettos and social situations and uh, have an occasional uh, dalliance here and there and emerged with a PhD. Mm -hmm. I have studied the Negro. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not a question, it's just a statement. <laughs> Very true one. So, in, 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 in what you project, you know, was in, in living blues, and I have to tell you, as I said before, most people living in blues don't play a note of music. In this living blues, uh, Fear of thinking that you all are in. Is there room for black women writers other than one? I would respond to that. Is, is, there, is there room? There is room. Where are you? Come forward. Uh, when you come well, there are 50 million black folks in, in the United States. You know, pretty much. So that they gotta be, that there has to be someone somewhere. Uh -huh. What I'm saying is, is, your, is it your intention ever to be inclusive? At a, at a more personal level of the people that you have dedicated yourselves to mm -hmm. writing about. Mm -hmm. We are published. Oh, we are published. Yeah. I appreciate the comments, but we, we are published by the by the University of Mississippi and uh, the Center for Southern Culture in particular. And um, every there's not a, a semester where there isn't some white kid that trucks up those stairs and says, "Hey, I love the blues. I'd love to write for him." I have not had. A black kid come up those stairs in five years. But you are. 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 Younger generation, they don't really under a uh, black. They don't really understand the rules or care to understand the rules because there's rap and some other things. And I do understand the them. But with those two things involved, I can see where you can have a horrible, a horrible situation to try to find somebody who would do that. Is that what I'm saying? Thank you. Yeah, may I just add something? And, and that is.
is that, you know, I, um, I don't want to be too polemical and, you know, critiquing the fact that you're five white people sitting around. <laughs> and, and, you know, because I think, I think that's fair. But, you know, white people can write about it. Um, I think, though, that we, we really have to, to dig deeply in trying to understand, like, your remark. I don't doubt for one minute that there's not a single black student that has trooped up those stairs to do that. I think also that, you know, uh, what she said is true, that there are many younger black students who, like immigrants who came over, or, you know, uh, trying to do something different, aren't identifying with, you know, early roots. Uh, but I also think that there are some black students who would see the face of Living Blues and, and feel like, you know, maybe they, they wouldn't. I mean, is there a, a black intern there? Or is there another black faculty member there? Is there somebody there that they could feel, you know, would be some kind of a welcoming face, somebody that they could talk to, uh, you know, in their, in their own way? You know, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think that we sometimes fail to understand the necessity for having that, that representation in order to, to be an attraction. The last thing I want to say is that when we talk about writing about black music and you know and writing about the blues, you know I think that there are a number of black writers. I mean, you named two black women yourself who have you know just done two wonderful works, you know Angela Davis and Hazel Harvey. But we can go all the way back to the work of Du Bois. <laughs> we want to talk about people writing about black music. You know, it isn't always women. We can look at you know uh, Baraka, aka Lloyd Jones. I mean, we can look at a number of black people, scholars, practitioners, you know, who have written about blues. And we thought that white people would written about blues, you know, but it's certainly not true that there's not been a black tradition beginning in the turn of the 20th century with Du Bois in writing about black music, including the blues. Uh, just going back to one of, the, one of the just pragmatic issues about that is that, as um, I mentioned earlier, that I guess a lot of the research, I guess for living blues, I see it as part of that sort of mosaic that Steve was talking about before that we're trying to fill in the gaps. So the issue really has been, how do we find someone who can write about someone we've never written about before and do like 5,000, I'm not saying that African American writers can't do that, but the issue is we're looking for experienced blues writers who are gonna write these life histories on someone who we've never covered before. So that that's one of the practical considerations and, and in general we don't ever hire students for that reason. Um, but, um, we, Living Blues has two employees, so that's the, uh, uh, it's not much of an organization. Uh, I just like to say we, uh, you know, we always did want to have more black writers on the staff. Yeah, and we, we know, and we've had, you know, there have been several dozen articles written by uh, black writers over the years. We had a black contributing editor. One of the co-founders was black, but make no mistake, I'm grateful for the work that you've done. I don't have to do that. That's <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful for the work that you've done. No, but I but I agree that you know Living Blues needs black writers. I just can I just um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that first of all it was our our tree. And you know what? And, and, and perhaps, perhaps if the situation is right and you don't have to study for different voice going in a different channel.